Yeah, and I see we now have about 20 people in the audience, so I think we can get ready to get started. And this is yeah, great. Well, welcome everyone. And if you are new, just join the room. It's awesome. We're so happy to see you. And to start, we'd love for you to share with us where you're dialing in from today and if there's any key learnings or a must watch session that you want to recommend to everyone else. Please share that in the chat as well. Yeah, so a quick intro. My name is Lisa. I'm currently a product leader at Microsoft building cybersecurity products. And I'm really excited to be moderating today's workshop with Heather Conklin. And to open with a quick intro before we dive straight into the workshop. So Heather Conklin is the Chief Operating Officer or COO of Torch, a fast-growing mission-driven SaaS startup. Torch is the people development platform that fuels growth through the power of trusted relationships in coaching, mentoring, and collaborative learning. Heather is passionate about leadership development and finds deep meaning and purpose in helping others succeed. Previously, Heather was a senior vice president and general manager of Salesforce Trailhead Business, which I'm sure many of us have known or interacted with. And she created and led the Associate Product Manager Program for Salesforce. Yeah, so today we're really excited to have Heather here conducting a workshop with her invitation to change the way we work. So over to you, Heather. All right. Thank you so much, Lisa. Lisa has been a huge help to me in getting all of this ready to go for all of you today. Um, so big thank you to you to start off. Um, but thank you all for being here. I am really, really excited. Um, hopefully you'll see throughout this workshop that I am incredibly passionate uh, about this space. And, you know, I've done a lot of thinking and hard work on it. And I just am really feeling a, a lot of gratitude and just really excited to share it with all of you today. So thanks for, for giving me some of your time. All right, let's dive in. So Lisa gave you a little bit about who I am. And if you need a refresher, it's there on the left. Um, that's a picture of me and my two daughters. Uh, I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. And I am in San Francisco. And we live here with my husband. And we have a crazy dog. And you know that's, that's a little bit about me. Um, but what I want to focus this slide on is these quotes on the right. And, you know, these are all different things that I have been told um, over the last several years about my leadership. And I don't put it on here to brag or to toot my own horn or anything like that. Um, but, you know, if you look at what people have shared back with me, they felt like they really belonged and they had a voice. Um, they felt supported in a way that they've never felt before that I draw them in and make them feel seen and valued and that they don't have to wear a mask when they're communicating with our team. I share those things because they're really important. Great leadership and the way that we show up every day for people, it matters. It makes people feel important and valued. And I think that this is something that is really underestimated and undervalued in how we work today. And that's what today is all about, is just inviting you in. And I want to show you how I got to this point and uh, the kind of work that I've done that led me here and hopefully help you get to that same point as well. And maybe you're already hearing these things about your leadership and that's amazing. Great job to you. Uh, there's always more room to practice and improve. So hopefully I have something here that can help you today. All right, so let's dig in. And first, I just want you to imagine a world where how we get things done is just as important as what we get done. So obviously today, you know, we're all very results focused and we're execution machines and we're getting a lot of stuff done every day. But how do we get that stuff done? Uh, and gone are the days in this world, I want you to imagine that gone are the days of accomplishing good things, but at the expense of other people sometimes. It's just, it's no longer a reality. And instead, we're unlocking really deep belonging amongst our teams. And that allows everybody to do our best work together. So why don't we have that world today? I found this quote from an HBR article that's really great, and we'll send a link out um, you know, to these slides after here so you can have access to all of the links and everything, but I really like this quote. The problem is most organizations today spend more time thinking about external value to the company than attending to people's internal sense of value. And that's because doing the internal value work really requires a set of skills that most of us have never been taught 
and, and therefore we've also not mastered them. And the irony in all of that is that if you ignore people's internal experience that they're having, it makes them spend a ton of time and energy defending their value and leaving them less energy to create that external value and get the work done. And I'm sure we've all been in a place where we've you know, had to feel like we were defending our value and improving our value. And, and that's not a fun place to be. And so really this session is about how do you attend to that internal sense of value and help people to unlock their best self and their best work. So how do you do it? How do you do this kind of work for you and your teams? I have a spoiler alert for all of you. It starts with you. And I know that's a tough answer because you want the magic answer, the magic bullet that will just get this world, you know, and, and kind of check that box and make it done. Um, but really, it's going to start with you. So don't worry. We're going to talk about what does that really mean and how do you do this? But um, you're going to be a big part of this story. So. This is a little bit of what we're going to cover today, um, and I think of this as becoming a human-centered leader. How do you be a leader that really cares deeply about the human beings that are around you and creates this kind of environment? So we'll go through these three steps today in this workshop. We'll talk about how do you understand your stories and see how they shape you and who you are. We will talk about how do you get grounded in that and be proud of all of the things that you have to offer. And then how do you authentically show up in the world and unlock meaningful connection for all the people around you? But why? Why does all this even matter in the first place? It's because human beings are hardwired for connection. And connection is very tied to the sense of belonging that you have in a group. And belonging allows everybody to show up as their real true self and do their best work. And with that, you know, that really leads to a lot of important things for how we work. It increases our performance. It increases the ability to innovate, to take risks, to team with the people around us. And in the time of the Great Resignation, it also helps a lot with retaining really, really amazing talent. So it's important for us personally as humans, and it's also really important for how we get work done. All right, so let's dive in here. We're going to go right into step one and thinking about understanding your stories and how they shape who you are. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to my friend Brene Brown here. Um, you will quickly see in this, uh, this workshop that I am uh, the world's number one Brene Brown fan, and I'll tell a story a little bit later about why and where I discovered her. Um, but if you're not familiar, she's a researcher and a storyteller, and she has incredible work um, that I cannot recommend more. But this is one of my favorite quotes from Brene Brown, and she talks a lot about how who we are is how we lead, and that self-awareness and self-love really, really matter. And, you know, I love a lot of the things that she does, but Dare to Lead is a book um, that she wrote, and that's where this quote is from. And if you haven't checked it out, it's really, really impactful for how you think about um, how you lead your teams in this human-centric kind of way. Um, so check that out. But let's talk more about this, this kind of idea of who we are is how we lead. And we're going to start with a little bit of a reflection. So hopefully you have a piece of paper nearby or you can open up a window um, and, and create it in some sort of a doc tool. Um, but let's take a, a three minute reflection time. And we're not going to ask you to share these so you can be really open and honest and vulnerable with yourself. But write down a significant life event. It can be something really big. It can be something that just deeply shaped you, positive or negative, doesn't really matter. But think about something that is significantly a part of your story in your life. And then think about how does that story impact the way that you lead and the way that you show up in the world today. So with that, we're going to take a quick pause um, for three minutes and I am going to play a little music while you think about this and then um, we'll move on. But I want you just to think about this and, and, and take that moment of reflection. Thank you. 
Okay, start wrapping up your reflection. We're about 30 seconds left. And it's okay. You can, these are things that you can, you know, totally just think on and reflect on after the session, too. You don't have to have a perfect answer today or anything. Um, and so this is just a, a question that you can kind of sit with a little bit as well. It doesn't have to be answered. All right, I'm gonna assume that we, <laughs> uh, your, your gift game is amazing, Lisa. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's continue on because of time. Um, and I'm gonna actually share my story here. Um, and so I wanted to share a little bit with you about my story about something that has happened to me in my life and how it impacts how I lead day to day. And so my story is about being a chameleon, which if you're not familiar with this lizard you're looking at, that's what a, a chameleon looks like. It's probably a little enhanced, but, um, but hey. So with my story, um, my parents actually got divorced when I was very young. So I was about four years old when my parents got divorced. And we had a pretty non-traditional custody relationship where I actually lived one week at my dad's house and then one week at my mom's house. And I just rotated back and forth week after week until I left and went to college. And my parents are really, really different people. Um, they are the kind of people where I'm not really sure exactly how they ever got married to each other, but, um, but you know, that, that's a different discussion maybe. Um, but that said, they were really different and the way that they operated their houses and the way that the, what they were expecting, um, you know, of us was, was pretty different in each house. And over the years, you know, step parents were introduced and removed from the equation. And there was just a lot of, of different, um, you know, situations that I, I had found myself in as I was growing up. And so with all of that, basically, I practiced a lot of getting into a situation and kind of reading the room, figuring out what was going on that particular week, um, you know, for my parents, like there was always that, that week gap in between when I had last seen them. And, and there are two single parents raising kids on their own, you know, week in and week out. And, and so I had to get really good at adapting and just kind of jumping in, quickly figuring out what was going on and how could I, you know, best meet the expectations of, of this household or this situation. And so that led me to be a bit of a chameleon. I could kind of quickly say, okay, I need to be, you know, this way this week, I need to be this way next week, um, and got really good at adapting and changing really, really fast. And so when I think about that and how that impacts how I lead every day, there's good and bad. And that's probably true of all of your stories. There's, you know, the good side of this is that I have really high intuition and EQ and I can still read the room better than a lot of people. I can come into a situation, quickly assess what's going on. I can hear the things that people are and aren't saying and adapt on the bad side it's just led me to be very externally focused. And I've always been thinking a lot about what do these people need from me versus what do I need in this situation? And so I've had to do a lot of hard work, um, which you'll hear more about in this workshop, um, around how do I really get better in touch with who Heather is and what Heather needs, and then how do I bring that more into the world? So that's my story, and I'll continue to share stories throughout this as well. But here, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of who we are is how we lead. So, you know, when you're born, you're this wonderful human that came into the world and you are your own unique self. And, you know, I mentioned I have those two daughters and watching the two of them, I've never been more convinced that we are all born with our own very unique, you know, personality and disposition and all these wonderful things. But then stuff starts to happen. Things happen to us. Like in my story, my parents got divorced and my environment really changed a lot. And then we're told a lot of things by our parents and our teachers and our friends and all kinds of different people in our lives. Those voices start to get into our head and shape who we are. And then last but not least, you know, there's a lot of societal norms and expectations, whether they're cultural things or things you're seeing from social media and TV and the internet, but you're constantly bombarded with messages about who you are supposed to be. And all those things really shape who you are and how you show up day to day. And we're going to come back to this image, um, but hopefully that's a good start of, of just a little bit of understanding that those things are really shaping who you are, and that is shaping how you're showing up day to day in the world. 
So to end this first section, I want you to think about this little bit of homework. And again, we'll, we'll make sure you have links to the slides. You can revisit these things. But the first step is just start paying more attention to your thoughts and your feelings. Thoughts and feelings are not facts. So just because you think something or feel something doesn't mean it's necessarily true. And I want you to practice just getting curious about where are those thoughts and feelings coming from and then decide if they're helpful or not. And I love this quote at the bottom, but the idea that between stimulus and response, there's a space for you to choose how you want to react to things. And in that space is your growth and your freedom. And so again, all those things happen to us and all the messages that we're told are constantly weighing on who we are and how we're showing up in the world, but just pay more attention to them, get curious about them and decide what's helpful maybe and what isn't helping you anymore. And with that, we're gonna head into step two. So in step two, we're going to talk about how do you get grounded in who you are? What is that center blue circle on that diagram we just looked at um, and really understanding what you have to offer? OK, so we're going to play a little true or false game and we're just going to do it in the chat. And I'm going to show you a statement and we'll just fire off in the chat. So get your get your fingers ready with true or false or you can write T or F if that's easier. You don't have to type it all out. Um, but let's get started and, you know, Feel free to just share, you know, I'll share out loud what my answers are, uh, but let's hear from everybody. So first one, I have experienced feelings of not being enough. It can be not enough of anything, um, but yes, I see a lot of truths and that is definitely true for me as well. Um, and I'll share a story about that in just a minute. All right. So many of us feel like we're not enough in different points in time. How about I'm hard on myself. You're critical maybe of the things that you're doing and how you're showing up. And if there's falses on some of these, great. And I applaud you. Uh, I think it's, it's easy to fall into some of these traps. All right. How about the next one? I invest enough time in taking care of myself. So do you really focus on taking care of yourself first and foremost? Uh, oh, I see a true from Jessica. I love that. Good for you. We need your tips and tricks on that one. Those, I see lots of falses. Rosa, true. Good. Good. I'm really glad to hear that. And how about this one? I expect a lot of myself and others. So you have high expectations, maybe. True. Yes, that's definitely true for me as well. Love that, INTJ. We can share our Myers-Briggs types. Both? Yeah, that's great. All right. And last one here is what I accomplish at work is a big part of my identity. And, you know, none of these are right or wrong. You know, there's no right or wrong in, in any of it, but um, just kind of getting a sense for where people are at. Too much, Andrew. Yeah, that's definitely how I have felt at different points in my life, too. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for bravely sharing your trues and falses. Uh, it's really, really great to see. And I, you know, I think these are all things that we all deal with and experience. Um, but why does it matter? That's what I want to get into next. Um, and so, uh, you know, we talked about Brene before, and this is another Brene quote. Again, you can quickly see I'm obsessed. But, uh, you know, one of the other things that Brene says is we can't give others what we don't have for ourselves. And I remember the first time I read this in one of her books and I was like, oh, man, like, you know, she was saying that you can't show more compassion for other people than you have compassion for yourself or you can't show more empathy or love or you can't belong in a group any more than you belong to yourself first. And the man reason I was like, oh, man, about it is that meant, again, that it starts with me and I had to come back to myself and really putting that work into myself. But again, if you're critical of yourself, you're going to naturally be critical of other people. Um, if you make mistakes and you're really hard on yourself about those mistakes and you don't show yourself a lot of empathy and compassion, that's going to limit how much of that you can show to the people on your teams, for example. And so really putting in that work to think about how you are treating yourself and, and how do you develop more of that self-awareness and self-love and compassion um, is going to be really important. So I'm going to share another story here. Um, and this one is just to illustrate that idea that we can't give others what we don't have for ourselves. And so much like this house here, uh, you know, this looks like it was a nice house. It's on the beach. Um, you know, it was looking good from the outside, but obviously something was wrong with the foundation and this house has toppled over. 
And that was definitely uh, part of my story as well. So Lisa mentioned at the start that I created the Associate Product Manager program at Salesforce. And in 2018, when we created that program, at that time, kind of on the surface or on the exterior, you would have said that I was on top of the world. I had this great Associate Product Manager program that I had started. We had amazing APMs that were in the program. I was running the program with right alongside our chief product officer. And so because I was doing this work with him so directly, I was getting all these amazing opportunities. So I got invited to like company wide executive meetings and I got invited to this leadership development training for senior leaders at the company. And again, all these opportunities were coming my way. But at the time, again, while it looked so good on the outside, my foundation was broken and I was deeply struggling with self-doubt. I was really crumbling under the weight of my own fear and my own self-doubt. I felt like I really just didn't have enough of whatever I needed to be successful in these environments. Like I didn't deserve them. Um, you know, I worried I was too junior, too inexperienced. Like I didn't know enough of the information or the answers. Um, and it was really, really getting to me. And so I ended up going to that leadership training that I got invited to. And I remember while I was there, one of the sessions that we were in, they gave us you know, a little bit of you know, post-session reading materials that we could dig into more. And I looked at this paper and it was a bunch of books and articles that we could read. And one of the books on the list um, was one by Brene Brown. And this is when I discovered Brene Brown. Um, and her book title was, I thought it was just me, but it isn't. Making the journey from what will they think to I am enough? And I remember seeing that title on the page and feeling like almost naked and exposed at that moment. Like she could see me right through this page. And it was so true to how exactly I was feeling in that moment about worrying so much about were other people going to think that I didn't deserve all these things that I was getting or that I wasn't qualified for them to just saying, you know what? I am enough. Me and myself, I am enough. And so at that point, I dove into the world of Brene Brown, which is where I got to be her number one fan. Uh, I also got a coach and I started working directly with an executive coach who was showing me a lot about how to work with all these thoughts and feelings that I was having, the fears that I had, how to really lean into the strengths that I had and really know what those are and how do I bring more of those to the table. And it led me on this journey of doing a lot of deep, like personal work. And it was hard. You know, it took a long time. These things are not ever done. Uh, I wish I could say that I did all that work and now I'm perfect and everything is wonderful and it's done. Um, but that's not how it works, unfortunately. It just becomes a lifelong practice of awareness and constantly, you know, just being mindful and intentional about how you're showing up in the world. And so, you know, I did that for a long time and I still do it all the time, um, but it really changed the way that I viewed myself in the world. I got really grounded and confident in what I could bring to the world um, and less fearful of all the things that other people would think and like kind of looking to others for that validation that I might need. And so uh, that really has changed the way, again, that I live, the way that I parent, the way that I am as a wife to my husband, a friend, a daughter, a sister. Um, and it definitely has made a huge impact on how I lead my teams. And we'll get to more about the, the interaction with all the team members in just a minute. Yes, the, the title of the book, good question, is I thought it was just me, but it isn't. And then there's a tagline after that. But if you Google Brene Brown in that, you'll find it for sure. Great. Okay, so we're back to this diagram and uh, all the things that we looked at before are still here. But I think a lot of the work that I went through to really build up my foundation and make sure that my house wasn't falling over um, was across the bottom here. The idea that I was really stripping away some of these things that had been put on me and getting in tune with who I really was and who I really am and developing more compassion for myself and the things that, you know, maybe... I am really great at these kinds of things and wanting to love myself for all the greatness that I bring into the world and also having compassion for myself where I'm not perfect because we're not perfect. We're all just human beings. And, you know, stripping away all of that is really where you get to this idea of this authentic, really grounded confidence. It's not arrogance. It's not, you know, running around shouting about how great you are all the time. It's that idea of, you know, there's humility, there's, 
acceptance and, and a lot of good things there. Um, but you can be really grounded and confident in who you are and what you bring into the world. And that impacts how you show up in the world and relate to other people. And so if you didn't do this work that's across the bottom here and you just let all these influences constantly push you in lots of different directions, you're going to show up in one way into the world. But by starting to get more mindful of what's going on for you and what has happened in your life that made you the way you are, stripping away things that are no longer serving you, then you can continue to get back to your truest self and bring that into the world. And that's really what all that hard work that I did over that time with my coach and with a lot of friends to support me, a lot of reading and Brene Brown. Uh, that's where I got to, to this world that I um, am able to now operate from. Okay, so homework to round out this section. We'll make sure to include the links to these. I think, yes, Lisa is on it. She's got the links here, but two exercises. And, you know, take time to do these. Don't check the box and just say, okay, well, whatever. I mapped the parts of myself and I wrote down my values, so done. Um, think about it and really sit with it and, and see how this feels for you. Um, I'm not going to go into either of them. Their instructions are all in there. Of course, one is a link to Brene. Um, but try these things and just use them as a way to get a little more of a deeper picture about who, who you are, who, what is that blue circle of who you really are and what are your unique things that you bring into the world and what are the things that you really care about. All right. And I should have said this at the start, but if as you have questions, definitely be an, uh, asking them in the chat or in the Q&A function, um, and we will get to them as we go. All right, so let's take this home with the third step. Uh, how do you then, you know, let's assume you've done that work and you figured out who you are and you're authentically grounded in who you are. Now, how do you show up that way and unlock meaningful connection for all the people around you? So what is connection anyway? And of course, I'm back to Brene. Uh, connection is the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued. And if you've ever had a really great connection with another person, you know that that energy, it's, it's like a physical palpable energy that can exist. And that is, as a human being, that's what you're hardwired for. You're hardwired for that kind of connection and that belonging that you get from finding that sort of deep connection with the people around you. Um, and so it's really important to think about how important this is to just human beings in general and what makes us tick. So we're all complex human beings. Uh, you know, we started with just the on paper resume style intro of me at the beginning of this, um, this session. And that's a bit of that tip of the iceberg, things that most people can see and know about me. But I've shared two different stories with you today that illustrate, you know, the depth of, of me and, and what makes up who Heather is and how I operate every day. And that just begins to scratch the surface, you know, of, of all the things about me. Um, so just knowing that we're complex, there's a part of us that we show out into the world every day. And there's a lot of us that we don't necessarily reveal to people and talk about day in and day out, but they're still there and they're impacting how you show up every single day, whether you like it or not. Uh, you know, you may be doing it consciously or you might be doing it subconsciously, but either way, these things are really changing how you show up in the world and working you are a complex person working with other complex people. Every person is the same iceberg kind of idea that we're all very complex and we all have a lot of unique things that shape us. And whether it's the things that happen to us or the stories that we tell ourselves or things that you know, have been a part of our life for a long time or things that are innately who we are, we're all different, but we're all very complex and we all want to feel seen and heard and valued. And so when you think about a bunch of these complex icebergs all interacting day in and day out, it's really important. Again, going back to that first quote from that HBR article around how important it is to, to navigate people's internal sense of value and appreciate their internal sense of value and where maybe we are giving them that kind of internal value or helping to support their internal value versus where we're making them defend it and prove it. Um, so. With that, my last story for you here is about unlocking meaningful connection. So 
Um, you know, I talked about how I went on that journey with that coach, worked on it for a long time. Um, I actually also had uh, my my second daughter during that time of deep personal work that I was doing with my coach and everything. And I took a six month maternity leave. And when I came back from maternity leave, I came back to this group of people, which is our very first cohort of APMs um, in our full time program at Salesforce. And when we created the APM program, we had this amazing curriculum about, you know, how to be a great PM at Salesforce. And we had all these activities to engage them and all kinds of things. And we were like, we've got it. We figured it all out. It's all going to work. And then they all showed up to start their first, first full-time job. And when I came back from maternity leave, they had just started. And a few weeks in, I realized that these really high performers, high potential people were all really struggling. And as soon as I started listening and figuring out what was going on, I knew it because I had been there in my previous story. They were struggling with feelings of not being enough, of not knowing how to fit in with their teams, of feeling like they didn't have a lot of value and a lot of answers that they could bring into their, their day to day. They lacked belonging. And so I decided I was going to teach them all of these things that I had learned from Brene. And I totally thought when I brought this to them that they were going to think that I had gone on maternity leave and just completely lost my mind, which maybe it would have been fair. But uh, I went for it anyway, because I felt so strongly about what I had personally learned. And I wanted to share that with them in a way that hopefully it could help them avoid some of the you know, difficulties that I had had. And so I sat down with them and taught them about courage and vulnerability and empathy. And then I led them in an activity, which is the first activity that you all did today. We had them think about something significant that happened in their life that shapes how they show up and lead in the world today. And we actually shared those stories with each other out loud in this group. And I still remember those stories and how amazing it was to just hear the stories of all these wonderful people and how they got to where they are today. And the connection that was created was that palpable connection that we talked about before. You could feel it. And it really changed the game for us with this program. And from then on, the program became half about how to be a great PM and the other half about how to be a self-aware human in the world who relates to the other humans that you're working with day in and day out. And it has fundamentally changed the way I view myself as a leader. Uh, it's changed the way that these people have really felt in the world. And this picture here is from the day that they graduated from the program. So it's a two year long program and they are graduating. And uh, we shared stories that day of what has this you know, journey been like for you? And that day we heard things like this program and the kind of work that we've done together through this focus that we have on the personal awareness and development, it made me feel more comfortable in my skin. It made it so that I felt like I had a sense of belonging in this group that I've never found in any other group that I've worked in before. It changed how my family sees me, that my parents and my friends noticed changes in who I am and that they wouldn't be who they are now without the work that we had been doing together. And so it matters. It really, really matters. And that kind of hearing that kind of feedback, that's what made me find such deep meaning and purpose and all of this. And it's what makes me come here today to share it all with you is because if I can help you do that for a couple more people, that's what it's all about for me. Um, and it really is just profound, that sense of connection and belonging, what it can do, not just for how we work, but how we live and how we show up in the world. Um, and, and I think that sense of belonging is needed right now more than ever on teams and you know, just human beings in general really, really crave this. And, and there's so many clear ways that we can start to help people show up as their whole self and feel that amazing sense of belonging. All right, so I want to take a minute here to uh, last activity is just to think for a second and then you can reply. You don't have to reply right away, uh, but think for a second about, you know, maybe there's a time where you did feel really seen and heard and valued um, or maybe you haven't. But if you think about what could it be like for you to, to show up as your whole self and feel that then what would be possible for you? It doesn't have to be work related. It can be anything at all. Um, but think about this for a minute and then would love to hear any answers, um, you know, for as courageous and vulnerable as you are willing to be. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a detailed thing, but maybe you would take more risks or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, please share in the chat about what would be possible for you 
if you could feel really seen and heard and valued for exactly who you are. We need a brave person to type first, but other than that, we'll get it going. What would be possible? Thank you to Rachel and Andrew. These are great. Bravely got us started. Yeah, the separation of, of work and personal life because of risk. Yes, there's so much of that happening. I think the, the pandemic started to break some of that away because we had all got crashed onto each other, but definitely still more room to, to bring more of your whole self. Yes, the exhaustion from being on. I think we can all relate to that. Safe answers, yes. Take more risks and say what's really on your mind, maybe. Yes, not self-censor, totally. Yes, the fear of your ambitions being a negative thing about you, totally. Awesome. Well, thank you so much um, for, for bravely sharing. And even if you didn't type, you know, think about this for yourself because um, just as it would help each of you to change how you show up in the world, you can unlock this for other people too. And that is really what makes me the most excited is that the more you do this work for yourself and, you know, kind of getting that grounded, authentic confidence, you show up in that way. And that unlocks that permission really for other people to do the same. And, you know, that's all I really did when I brought that Brene Brown to the APMs, I just took a big risk. And I was like, I don't know, I'm going to go tell them about what matters to me right now and what's on my mind. And I I thought they would think I was crazy. We didn't talk about those things at work before, um, but I went for it and it really unlocked that ability for everybody else to do the same. And that's really, really powerful when that happens. All right. So last homework for you. I want you to think about how can you get to know those icebergs of people that are on your teams and that you interact with. And the best way I know to do that is just to get really curious Get curious and practice asking really powerful questions to help build connection. Um, you know, I've, I've sat a lot with this idea of how powerful questions are. And I think, you know, they're risky. You know, we talked about risk in a couple of different ways in the chat here. Questions are a little risky because you don't know what they're going to say. Um, you don't know how they're going to feel. You're not sure where the conversation will go. But trust yourself and be courageous enough and brave enough to ask these powerful questions, open-ended things about who people really are, not just what did you do on your weekend or what are you going to, you know, are you taking any trip this summer? Those are the easy ones. Don't ask the easy ones. Ask powerful ones. Who are some of the most influential people in your life? What was your life like growing up? What aspirations do you have for what you want to do in the next few years outside of work? You know, get to know who people really are and encourage that deeper connection and the deeper discovery and insights. And of course, I had to give you one more Brene Brown quote to end this. And, um, and I love this and I've certainly found it to be true, which is that courage is contagious. When I was able to show up and be really courageous that day by sharing my story with the APMs um, and teaching them about these things that I had learned, they you know, in turn started to be more courageous and vulnerable with their stories as well. And so you can actually start to influence this day in and day out, but you have to make a choice. All right. So wrapping up here, uh, these are the key takeaways. You know, this is what we just walked through, you know, not make sure you're understanding your own stories you're understanding how they shape who you are. You're getting really grounded in whatever, whatever is revealed about who you are and what you bring to the table. Get grounded in that and be proud of it and authentically yourself. And that will help you to show up in that kind of authentic way and unlock that permission for other people. And hopefully you've seen how that can really change how your teams and everyone interact. So with that, um, I think we might actually, and Lisa, you correct me if I'm wrong, but we might have a few minutes for some, some questions if anybody has questions. I was a little worried we'd run out of time, but I think we're doing okay. 
Yeah, for me, it's amazing that time just flew right by because I was so um, focused on the stories that you were sharing. So thank you so much. You. And yeah, I think as we mentioned, we do have a couple minutes at this time. I think we have maybe five to six minutes to 1.50 or at least to two o'clock before the next session begin. Um, in the audience, we have about 39 people. So Heather, would you like to stop sharing slides? And then sure. um, for folks who are in the audience, I'll encourage you to either sign up. I think you can offer to share your video and audio and I can bring you on stage to ask a question. Or if you're not able to unmute and come on camera in the meantime, feel free to do so in the chat and I can read out the question so that we can answer on screen. So what questions do you all have that we can answer? It can be anything. It can even be more about the stories that I've shared. How do you ease into asking these questions and building connection with colleagues who have mostly seen your work self? Yes. Amazing question, Olivia. Uh, it, this is one of the things I have thought about a lot in all of this, which is, you know, just like if you think about how you interact with your family or your friends, there's patterns, right? Everybody has a pattern of how things go. And at work, we have some very, you know, probably the some of the most rigid, uh, you know, patterns and expectations. Um, and so it can be tough to like break that ice and, and start to say, you know what, we're going to go in a little different way now. So here's two ideas I have for you that you can try. One is super simple. Um, I started starting all of my leadership meetings, or you could do this on a scrum team meeting or whatever kind of meetings you have, if, if you're you know, in any ability to, to direct what is happening in these meetings, um, start with sharing. Start with sharing. It could be something like I've done um, like a red, yellow, green check-in where you could say, you know what, I'm feeling red today. I'm under a ton of stress. I have a lot of stuff going on at home. And you know, like this weekend, my kids were sick all weekend. So I'm like still recovering from that. Um, whatever it is, ask people to share something personal and something professional and, and a little bit about how they're doing. And that's just kind of an easy way where you start to hear tidbits of, you know, their life and, and what matters to them. And that can start to at least move you in the direction of not just, you know, execution mode and getting, you know, work talk and getting a little bit closer to that. Um, that more deeper sharing. And then the second idea I have for you is, you know, starting with a, with some sort of a prompt. Um, I can, I'll, I'll type it in in just a second, but um, another one of my favorite people like a Brene Brown is Esther Perel. And Esther has a lot of really amazing um, work around the power of sharing stories. And if you can give people open-ended prompts that, you know, are, are you can start with the easier ones, um, like, who's a very influential person in your life. And you could start a meeting that way and do like a round robin sharing again, where it doesn't feel like you're putting anybody on the spot and you're not asking them to be overly vulnerable. Um, but, you know, just finding ways to get people talking and sharing their stories. I think that's the easiest way in. And then, you know, if you have like a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them or a coffee or a lunch, you can always be like, oh, you shared about X. Tell me more about that and just get curious. Uh, and that's a, a good way to to dig in more. So hopefully that some of those help. Yeah, uh, and I'm also bringing Amy on stage. Oh, awesome. um, yes. Hey, great. Hi, Hi Amy. Amy. I was just going to ask if you had any tips for doing this next in virtually. Um, I feel like it, it comes a little more naturally when you're in person with somebody to kind of like engage in these sort of conversations. Any tips for the virtual world? Yes, uh, it's totally true. I think it is a little bit easier when you're in person, you know, but in some ways, I think that the virtual world can sometimes make people even feel a little bit safer because at least, you know, when you're in person in a room with people, you're, you're like, you're, you're there, there's nothing in between you. It feels like more exposed and vulnerable just by the nature of being together in one room versus when you're on the other side of the screen and, you know, you've got this like virtual distance between you. Um, I think it does let people maybe share more. But again, the best way that I have found in the virtual space is just to make it a priority to share something more, you know, personal and deeper about yourselves, even in the work context. So don't say this is a work meeting, so we can't talk about those things or 
we've got a lot of stuff to get done. And so therefore, you know, put that on the back burner. The more time you can actually invest in this um, and just make, again, make a space and make it sort of a habit, I think the better. Um, and you, you really can do that um, pretty easily in, in this in this virtual environment. You just have to make it a priority. As usual, it comes down to priorities with all the things as, as product people out in the world. So thank, thank you for you. coming and asking. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Amy, for your question. All right. And I think for the next two, I think are actually somewhat tied or related. So Katie asked a question about what happens if others at C-suite or leadership may or may not share those values, right? And if so, how do you deal with that difference? I think that's tied to Emily's question, which is related to sharing values, especially at the leadership level. There may be perceptional biases around what type of questions or sentiment are quote unquote high performance type questions and sharing an example of wanting to spend more time with the family, but maybe having some fear or um, yeah, fear of thoughts around sharing that before being perceived a certain way. Yeah. Um, okay. So, you know, getting your leadership to care um, is, the, is I think, pretty, it is difficult. I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, if you don't have that kind of su support from, um, from all the people around you, it can be hard, but here's what I I've done. Um, and I would encourage you to do is as people working on, on these teams day to day, you see a lot of things that your leaders are never going to see, right? They're not in every meeting. They're not in these conversations. They're not maybe a part of how the work is getting done. And so if you see that there's an opportunity to build a deeper sense of connection and belonging through maybe leaning into more of these sorts of things, then go to your leader and say, hey, you know, I feel like this would be a huge opportunity for us. And I'm happy to be the champion of, of figuring out how we do that and how do we incorporate some of those practices into our day to day. But I think it's really, really important. And can I get your support or, you know, what's your thoughts and feedback on that? Hey, I mean, as a leader myself, like I don't think I would have ever been like, oh, you know, upset about somebody coming to me with that kind of um, proposal. Like I think if it matters to you and you think it would make an impact on the team, then any leader hopefully uh, should be really um, just grateful that you're bringing it up and, and willing to, to help make that change. So that's one way that I have found um, it has helped. And I've had to do that myself with with my leadership. Like you know, I talked about the APM program with the chief product officer. I had to tell him, I think this is the way we should run this, not just teach them about product management, but this is really important and take that initiative to start to make it happen um, versus waiting for them to come, you know, down from on high and say, this is how we're going to do things going forward. Like take that initiative to push it up instead. Um, you know, as far as things like what you really want versus what you think you're supposed to do, you know, I think it really comes back to some of those things we were talking about before about the stories that maybe um, Brittany has this concept of the stories you tell yourself. You might tell yourself in, in you know, I, I want to caveat what I'm about to say with there are very real things at work um, that make it hard for working moms, especially, I know that's what you were talking about, wanting to spend time with your kids. So I'm not saying it's just a story you're telling yourself and everything's great. That is definitely not true. There's a lot of things that we, you know, we need to do better for our working moms and working parents in general. But I do think that if it's a priority for you and you can say, you know what, it's really important to me. Like I deeply value spending time with my kids. And if I can, you know, draw these couple of boundaries in these ways to get that time with my kids, then when I am working, I can be fully present and I can really feel like if I'm supported as a, you know, a mom, out in the, a working mom in the world, then I can do my best work here when I am here. Um, and so there's ways to just draw your boundaries and lean into how that's going to make you better um, as, as a leader. And it, it's, it's great to want to spend time with your kids. And I think that, you know, that's why I really love this idea of human leaders who care about you as a human who have a whole life outside of work every single day. And so I think the other thing I would say is, as you are working with, you know, if you're leading teams or 
working with other people, like you can also pass it for like pay it forward, like be the leader who really values people's time outside of work and wants to make them have the right kind of work life balance that they need. Um, and, and we can all make change just, you know, with this group of, you know, 45 people on this call today. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And I think from that element as well, as I'm, as I'm reflecting on that, I think one area which is in alignment with what benefits the team as well, right? So I know one area that my team often talks about is, hey, we don't want to be the blocker on the team. And what that translates into is we don't want to be the one holding all of the context or the institutional knowledge. So one of the way to create boundaries, especially trying to pause or minimize interrupts, such as slacks and email, is thinking through how can I unblock others? And maybe that's knowledge management. Maybe that's documentation. Maybe that is just in your response already having out of office response and say, hey, for X, Y, Z question, pointing to specific people. So that's something I've appreciated with my team and my manager's guidance to say, yeah, let's try to think about how we can unblock others even when we're not there and therefore creating the boundaries to really protect our personal time and not feel like we have to be on call all the yeah. time. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's great. Lovely. Great. So we have a couple minutes left. I want to see if anyone has last questions they would like to share. If you'd like to come on screen, please make sure. I think there's a button on the top right that says share video and audio. So you can do that too. And I'm happy to bring you on stage. And great. And I see Emily has a comment thanking. Yeah. Yeah, Gather modeling it, modeling what, uh, you know, especially as you move into any sort of leader, yes, model the change you want to be. Exactly. Um, you know, if, if you're leading people and working with people and you're emailing them at all hours of the day, they start to, even without you ever saying it, they start to assume that means I need to be on all day mm -hmm. and all day long, right? And that might not be your intent, but that is the impact that you're having through doing that. So really think about it. And Lisa, I love all those tips that you shared of just... It's just getting intentional about how do we get work done together as humans and respect each other's boundaries and things like that. Yeah. Man, that is a big topic, Andrew. I feel like <laughs> that would be a really interesting thing to chat with you more about. Um, you know, I think that making this space like that, that to me is what belonging is all about. And, and maybe people don't feel comfortable, you know, like revealing that they are, you know, neurodivergent, but I think that making it so that, you know, you don't have to be, for example, I, you know, it's a little different, but like think, makes me think of it with the social skills is you don't have to be like an outgoing chatty person to succeed on this team, you know, like making space for people who are quiet and giving different ways of sharing feedback and things um, that maybe doesn't look like, you know, we've probably all been in the meeting where you have to be like the loudest voice in the room or you have to like jump in as quickly as possible with your smart point. You know, um, that doesn't work for a lot of people, um, neurodivergent or not. Like it doesn't really, you know, there's all kinds of different styles and really understanding the styles of the people on the team and making space for whatever style and whatever way of um, thinking and working and learning that you have. Um, I think that's the, the best way is um, just making, again, that that space for lots of different ways of getting things done. But it's a really great question, and I would totally be into talking more. Yeah. Right. So I think with that, we'll wrap up the conversation as Heather has shared, right? I know if you click on her profile, you'll be able to find her LinkedIn. So definitely encourage everyone to reach out and connect with other folks who are here on the call today. Because I think with, especially at any conferences, with the amount of options you have on the agenda, there's a reason why you chose to attend this workshop out of the other concurrent sessions. So with that in mind, I think connecting with other attendees who are here today, right now, there's already a common theme that you all care about changing the way we work, becoming a more authentic leader, and really empowering both yourself and your team to succeed in this hybrid virtual world that we all live in right now. So thank you, Heather, again, for your fantastic workshop. I know you share a lot of resources and links. So I just want to encourage everyone before you jump off, um, on top of the chat, there's a review button and you see, funny enough, four stars instead of five stars. Please click on that 
And I think it will open up a new tab where you can give your quick one question review for today's session. That would be super helpful. I know that's something that the Women Product Organizing Team has asked everyone to do so that they are gathering feedback and they're able to share that with speakers like Heather. So definitely take a moment before you hop off the call to use the review tab. Again, it's on the right underneath the chat label and it says review with four colored in stars. Great. Awesome. A huge thank, thank you, you Lisa. You've been an amazing moderator for this session. Yes, facilitator, moderator. Um, you've done an awesome, awesome job, and I appreciate all your help. And thank you all. Um, like Lisa said, I know you had a lot of places you could be today, whether it was in this conference or elsewhere. So just really, really appreciate your time. Um, and I hope that this sparked some idea that you can take back and incorporate into your day to day. And let's all let's all make the the workplace a little more human. We can do it together. So thank you all very, very much. Wonderful. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.